Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Aquarius Rising Australia. And we are not live today because we were naughty and got a smack on the wrist for sharing <laughs> truths again. But hey, we shall prevail and we shall persevere. <laughs> so I'm delighted to have with us again our beautiful Gabby Chung and Stephen Masters back with us. Hey, guys. How you all doing? Thank you. How are you, Chantal? How are you, Mom? Mm -hmm. Hi guys. <laughs> really good. Good to have you here. And we're going to be chatting about some interesting things. And I was just saying, you Aussies need to brush up on your accents, okay? <laughs> okay. I'll speak, I'll speak as as for us. As I can. <laughs> it's a hard one. It's a hard one. <laughs> it might be just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i'll try well we yeah, i'll try and i'll try and sort of up my game yeah as well so it's cool <laughs> oh dear okay so we're going to be talking about mk ultra and valango forests and i've never even heard about that in ours but i'm really looking forward to hearing about this so over to you two beautiful people yeah um i'll just point out too um for anyone that hasn't seen them we've had Stephen masters on aquarius rising a couple of times already um he's done a fantastic interview explaining um his run-ins with ivan malat who is a very well-known serial killer within australia and also um his experiences in Derek. so if you haven't seen those ones definitely go check them out as well because they're fantastic um, and today we just wanted to go a little bit deeper um, into those topics and, yeah, really explore, I guess, just the, the high level of organisation that really operates um, around this exploitation of our children in Australia. So Bangalore Forest in New South Wales Bangalore. is... <laughs> Bangalore. <laughs> um, is where um, Ivan Malat's... Um, murders um, were found so it's quite famous for that and it's got a lot of really interesting connections we've got um, you know it's not far from Holmesworth um, army base etc which is known for SRA and child exploitation and experimentation yeah could I just just let you know Langolo State Forest is down south it's a bit of a distance from Holmesworth sorry it was the Heathcote National Park, which is the close one to oh, okay. Yeah, just need to just sort of correct you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Old Werb is a long way from the Belanglow Forest, yeah? Okay. The Belanglow Forest is um, located in the Southern Highlands, yeah, and it's um, off the Hume Highway, yeah, mm -hmm. which the yeah, Southern Highlands is down Barrow Way, yeah? Yeah. Like Hilltop, Mittagong. Those areas, yeah, that's the Southern mm -hmm. Highlands of New South Wales. Oh. Um, and okay, Stephen, no, no, that's good. That's great because I'm not totally familiar with the area either. Yeah. And Stephen's yeah. had um, a couple of very close calls with um, Ivan Malat, basically a, a trafficking attempt from Costello's and also running in Bangalore Park. So it's quite interesting to see that this public national park, you know, that people can go walking in, et cetera, um, is really set up for, for rituals and has been used by the Luciferians um, for that kind of thing as well, which we can see with the, the murders. So I know when we were chatting, um, Stephen, you were talking about the pistol range being really nearby, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah, the firing uh, range is definitely fun. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and that's got okay. some really links. Yeah, so would you like me to um, tell you the, you know, like what I've done yeah. through my research and, and the disturbing parallels that I found to my first testimony where I was ambushed and shot at, like me and my two other mates were ambushed and shot at in 1980 out at Heathcote by Ivan Malat, Heathcote National Park. Mm. And I said uh, in that testimony, that nobody would have ever paid attention to those gunshots because of the fire and range being in the vicinity of where Malad had shot at us, yes. Yeah? And mm -hmm. the disturbing parallels that I found during my research of late, because I've just got this drive to keep going with this, because I, you know, as I said, I wouldn't like to have a loved one out there, missing loved one that I didn't know where they were. So my my input, I think, should spark someone maybe to 
you know, into an investigation to go out and check these places out because I believe that, you know, there, there was murders going on out there and, and rituals and so forth, as you know. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what keeps me keeps me going with this too as well. And being uh, being a victim as well, uh, you know, surviving victim of my life, yeah. And as I said, I've found some disturbing parallels, like with timings of of Malak going to the Blanglo Forest first, you know, up until the first murders, like timelines, everything, yeah? Mm -hmm. And what it is, what I found is, the first disturbing thing that I found was, yes, there was a a barrel pistol club was relocated from Hilltop. There was a pistol range at Hilltop. It was relocated to the Blanglo Forest in the late 80s. Okay, so yes, there's a firing range in the Blangla Forest, not too far from where all the bodies were found. They were all found to one side of the Blangla Forest. The recreation side of Blangla Forest is one side, and the shooting range is the other side. Okay, and as I said, how all the convenient. bodies. Sorry, um, I'm just thinking how convenient to have the shooting range over there, and then of course discovering a whole bunch of bodies on the other side. So no one really gets suspicious, do they? Because exactly. it's a and people, way. Gosh, how... Yeah, mm. exactly. And people that know where they, that there's a firing range ain't going to go nowhere near that firing range. That's why these Luciferians, I believe, use these places, knowing that they won't be disturbed or caught out, yeah? Well, thinking that would they wouldn't have been anyway. But, um, yes, yeah, some disturbing, as I said, there's no coincidences to this because I did mention it in my first testimony about these foreign rangers, and now one turns up, you know, like I've just discovered there was one in the Blanglo Forest. What's even more disturbing about it is they nominate late 1980s that the um, pistol club was moved from Hilltop into the Blanglo Forest. Malat. And his wife was known, Malat was known to take his wife into the Blanglo Forest on a number of occasions, I think about mid 80, like when I say mid 80, 85. So Malat's in the forest now, looking, yeah, looking for a place for these, yeah, to do these rituals and so forth and killings and murders. Okay, then we've got. Um, Malat looking and his wife, he's taking his wife around the Blanglow Forest, okay, mid-80s. The Blanglow Pistol Club opened there in the late 80s and the first bodies, first victims went missing in the 80s and that's when they were first late 80s, like 89, yeah? And I look at, I, I, I sort of dove really deep into it and thought, what days would these clubs be open, these firing ranges, okay? I look up and it's mainly weekends, okay? They do have midweek international competitions and stuff like that, but mainly weekends is open, the foreign range is open. So then it makes me look at when these victims, the seven backpackers, had went missing. All of them, except for the two German couples, Garble and Norgebauer, every other one of them went missing Saturday, Sunday, like a weekend, yeah? Mm -hmm. When that foreign range may have been operational too, so... Okay, um, and the two Germans, they went missing on the Thursday and they were found closest to the, like more to the front of the Blanglow Forest where the others were right up the back in the vicinity of the firing range. So, yeah, just timelines, looking at timelines when Malat was first entered that forest in the early 80s to when the pistol club was moved. It just looks like this was a premeditated plan. These can't be coincidences. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I liked how um you were saying uh, Bob Carr was um actually quite yeah. involved with that move as well. And obviously, yes, we know I... Bob Carr was named in the Woods Royal Commission by a number of survivors for abuse. Um, and he's also been linked to you know secret societies like Bohemian Grove. So he's a very powerful figure in Australia and beyond. That's correct. He was placed there, as I said to you, with you know, to, to block Malat's pills and all the rest of it, because mm-hmm. as I said, you know, they all all um prequel Costellos. But um, yeah, he had an input into the firing range, him and um another person. Okay, the people at Hilltop were pushing to have the firing range moved into the Blangalow Forest while the people surrounding in surrounding areas of the Blangalow Forest were opposing it. They they were against it. 
Okay, then Frank Sartor. He was um Frank Sartor was former mayor of Sydney as well, too. But um mm -hmm. he ended up being um he ended up being something to do with oh, he was a planning minister actually, and he took control of the project, removing any input in from the public. So they virtually just said the fire and range is going there, he's ain't having a say. Yeah. That's how mm -hmm. adamant they were to pick a fire and range in that forest. Yeah, yeah so. important strings. And I think Ivan Milat's brother was um, a president at that club as well. Is that, that is right? correct. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Alex Milat was one time the president of, I believe, Hilltop Pistol Club. Alex Milat now is still a, um, he's a ca campaigner for guns. I think he's something to do. Uh, I definitely know he's a gun lobbyist, like he campaigns, yeah. Mm. But um, I think he's something to do. I did read something to do with liberals or something like that. And he's living in in Brisbane, uh, up in Queensland somewhere. Mm. Yeah. So, but what I find quite bizarre is yes, Bob Carr keeps up pop popping up everywhere. Doesn't like he? I said, Langlo Forest, Ivan Malat, you know what I mean? Costellos. Too many coincidences. But, well, when I say too many. Uh, these ain't coincidences, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we know <laughs> Sorry, what was that, Chantal? So I said nothing is really a coincidence, a coincidence mm -hmm. is it? Because, you know, when we look at the way, I mean, in the last two years or so that I've been doing this, we realise that they, they've, these guys have really thought we are so dumb and actually we have been because we're walking around with eyes wide shut. And, you know, I think also because the majority of human beings doesn't imagine that this kind of evil exists to the level that it does. You know, what we really have been fed um, is that there's the odd serial killer who's very clever and who gets away with it for a while and then they get caught and there's a big court case and then they put in jail. But no one really um, would think that this is such a slick, and I know, Stephen, from our last conversations that we've had, you know, what really horrified me so much, uh, specifically in your particular incidents was, uh, incident, was that the slick pedo rings that were operating within the, the, the boys' homes, within the, the, the circles of police, um, counsellors, uh, I, I, I want to say teachers, but not teachers, but whoever was looking after you guys or, you know, taking care or supposedly taking care of you guys. No one would imagine that something like that is really going on. So it really has been an, a, a, a time of opening our eyes and waking up. And I mean, now when we're looking at these coincidences, they really aren't because you can see how everything has then been put into place and these nefarious ones are like just waiting for the hikers or whatever they are to come there. And it's really just so bizarre, I'm not even bizarre, but it's so well orchestrated. Yeah, well, they but, use these, as you said, Chantel, they use these people, they're, they're actually, you look at, okay, I'll look at Ivan Milan, as I said, he was thrown on the bus, and you look at Martin Bryant's case, there's a lot more. They, they, they use these people as patsies. Once they're finished with them, or if they compromise the order, that's when they punish them severely and, and just throw them under the bus, yeah? It's, exactly. Yeah, when they, when, when they become a liability to them, yeah? Once they become a liability to them, under the bus they go. But like mm -hmm. you said, yeah, they paint a picture that these are just like one-off sort of things where a serial killer's been going about, yeah? And, and have these court cases and they give their narratives to it, which ain't the true narratives, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's why people have, have got to look outside the box and don't be contained to what you're told. So that's, true. You know, that, that's how you become knowledgeable, yes? And do do a lot of, um, you know, research is a good thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's, how, that's how journalists do their work as well. It's called invest their journal investigative journalism, so to speak, you know what I mean? Mm. Well, I don't know how many journalists have been doing this work because really, as far as I can tell, all these journalists or the majority of them have been part of this narrative for so long. It actually horrifies me to, mm. to see how many journalists fall for this nonsense 
hook, line, and sinker. They don't even get me started on journalists right yeah. now. Well, they're the I think they well know as well, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they're just covering up. Like Ivan Milat's case is a really great example of that in Australia because his common knowledge on the streets that he's a serial killer, but not many people know the details of like how the bodies were found. Like they all had... Um, like pyramids of like branches and sticks over them. The faces were head down, the um, hands were behind them. There was like a lot multiple wounds into the bodies. And like, you know, even, even the judge of that case was saying, you know, Ivan Milat did not do this on his own. And then Ivan Milat's statement was, I had at least seven people with me. Um, and, you know, one low, one low lying freak from the cult has been thrown under the bus, do you know what I mean? So it really shows what a small narrative um, we're actually shown of it. Um, and I know, uh, like, Ivan spent some time, and we were talking about this earlier, Stephen, with um, Noel Manning in um, prison. Oh, my God. So, yeah, so he had a couple of months there, you know, with this other inmate and was just letting it all out, like, talking about that. And, um, Stephen, you'll probably explain this really well, but, you know, they're actually very proud of, like, what they've done, you know, and he was, um, you know, I guess a, a cult, um, a cult runaround boy, like getting the job done for them and getting paid off. So, yeah. What I'd like to, what I'd like to discuss too is um, before I get into Noel Manning and the Long Bay um, part of it, because that was um, back in seventy four. Okay, 19, 1974, Yeah. Well, Malat before before he was put in Long Bay, and the reason why he was put in Long Bay because he was on remand. Okay, on bail, so to speak some serious um, charges, okay? One of them was abduction and rape of two girls from Liverpool. Um, and there was another one, I think he, it was for an armed robbery charge, okay? Now, him doing silly things like that and doing what he was doing for the elites, that compromised them back then too. So mm -hmm. if you follow the leads to how Malat left Australian soils, to go to New Zealand, it's quite bizarre. And you'll know that he was assisted out by very smart people, very powerful people, so to speak, yeah. Sounds familiar, because, doesn't um, it? Absolutely. He left, he left Australian, I believe he went over to New Zealand in um, 1971. And, okay, the, he left his shoes at the Gap. You know, the Gap is notorious for people, you know, commit allegedly committing suicide off it. Yeah, what, he, what it was, I don't think Malat was smart enough to even plan this. And it took someone, I believe, like John Mars and his lawyer would have been the mastermind behind all this, being, you know, the Luciferian pedophile that he was. Okay, so he was assisted out of Australia to New Zealand. But before he left to go to New Zealand, he also went to Queensland and then ended up in Adelaide somewhere before he left Adelaide to, to go to New Zealand. Now, what I find quite interesting about this is that there's nothing, nobody knows how Ivan Malat lived over there, like how, what work he'd done. There's no, nothing on him, you know what I mean? My beliefs are, as I spoke to you um, earlier, Gabby, about Frank Houston. Mm. Frank Houston was a notorious pedophile based in New Zealand. I believe... The, the, the Luciferian connections there between New Zealand and Australia and, and other parts of the world, of course, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's who, he's, who Malat was assisted by, was it was a Luciferian pedophile network in New Zealand. And Frank, as, as I said, Frank Houston. you got to look at Frank Houston's movements too. He, came, he migrated out here in 1977, right? He set up Hillsong Church in, um, I think it was... Uh, Wollamaloo or War Waterloo, I think. Yeah, Waterloo in Sydney. Now, there's no two ways about it, like setting up, but that's close to King's Cross area, yeah? And there's mm -hmm. no two ways about it that Frank used to be part of the, the Luciferian Satanic Pedophile Network would have attended Costello's as well. I guarantee there'd probably be survivors out there that'd be able to confirm that because, as I said, yeah, he, you know, you look at Derek, and where boys were being sex trafficked from there mm -hmm. to, to Costello's and other locations. And then Frank Houston turns up at Derek with Stevie Wright. You know what I mean? Like, I want to ask you something. 
Something that's just occurred to me now, which I don't know, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure if you'd have any knowledge of this, but this is pure speculation on my part. But right now, I think nothing is so far off the charts. When we look at someone like Avin Milat, and let's say even Frank Houston, who are notorious pedos, do you think it's possible that when they were little kids, and they were maybe taken into the system in whichever way um, these guys take them into the system. We know like a lot of them are taken in at a very young age and had done SRA and all sorts of MK ultra stuff and mind control stuff done on them. Do you think they were programmed or do you think it's a possibility rather because it's a speculation? Well, I honestly do you think, think as I've said, well, I'm Oh, sorry, Sean. I know that Ivan Malat was programmed, MK Ultra programmed in the system. I'm not too sure about Frank Houston's background, but possibly what I'd say if he didn't go through these institutions, he was probably born into a cult. You know what I mean? Like through family and so forth. Yeah. Because yeah. it seems to me, it, it really seems to me when we're looking at this, like um, the slick way in which it's done and the, and the elite that are connected to him, that it, it's very possible that he could well have been programmed by them for these purposes in order yeah, to correct. become a serial yeah, killer. Yep. Absolutely. So they, correct. they can use him and control him and handle him to for their own nefarious purposes, like a little robot. You know, we know that their handlers like just kind of press a button. And a lot of the time, these guys don't, I mean, we know, uh, depending on the level of mind control they've had, you know, they literally like, they'll be sleeping at night, boom, a button gets pressed, literally, and these guys get up, do what they have to do, come back, and tomorrow morning, they have absolutely no recollection or no memory. Yeah, correct. Shane, tell I want to, I'm, I'm really glad that you've mentioned this, because I want to go into something about Derek with the MK Ultra in there, right? And you asked me in the first interview when I mentioned about Subproject sub 68 um, Psychic Drive and you asked me what that was and I said it was to do with um, creating different alders and stuff like that, yeah, different files in the mind, okay? But it's it's actually de-patterning, right? Now, something bizarre happened to me back in 2019 Okay, I started speaking out. This is when I really started speaking out. I'd been to Canberra. I'd been to National Apology Day down in Canberra and um, done my first video with Out of the Gates in America. Then one night, I was laying back in, and this is why I know that what I was subjected to in Derek as well, okay, through this phone call. I copped a bizarre phone call one night. It was about six o'clock on a Sunday night. I, I told people straight after it and sent the phone number to the number that called me, okay? So, yeah, and like, because I was worried about the phone call, believe me. What it was, in Subproject 68 psychic, psychic Driving, they de-pattern you and they, through masses amounts of drugs and masses amounts of electricity, okay? And then um, what they do is play loop tapes over and over again, repetitive, something repetitive. Well, this phone call that I got this night on the Sunday night, I picked the like, answered my phone. No one, no one had did. And straight away, there's a recording my phone, and it said three times. It repeated, "Why did you kill the old lady? Why did you kill the old lady? Why did you kill the old lady?" That was my trigger cue. That's what they programmed me and Derek, and that's what was supposed to be my trigger cue. Yep. Yeah. And I, as I said to you, I, I panicked about it. I sent you know the phone number to a lady in America that I, a friend in America, Casey Marie Gates, and I spoke to you earlier about this, Gabby, and I told you that she had rung that number or me off a landline telephone because I wasn't going to ring it back off my phone, and that phone was instant, straight away disconnected because it was the same day that I gave her, sorry, the same night that I gave her that number. Yeah, she'd rung it, and it was straight away disconnected. Wow. So, yeah, okay. it wasn't just someone... How come you remembered? I mean, it's like obviously there must have, must have been a glitch somewhere that you were aware of what was happening because that would generally happen when there's when they're now out of whatever their normal mind and they've moved into one of their altars. I would imagine. So well, how, said, how come 
how come you were lucky enough to know what was going on there? What happened there? You know, you know what? I spoke to Gabby early today, Chantal, and I, I honestly believe that my programming broke down in Derek during their programming when I had the stroke, yeah? Um, I think that, that was the end of the program when they done, yeah. You with me? That's my beliefs that that's where my program... But they still, obviously, as you said, they, they have over other programs if one fails. So that night, that phone call, I would say that was a test to the C because one broke down to see if they could trigger me off another. Wow. So I am now fully convinced that what these guys are doing was using youngsters like yourself that yep. were, had either been neglected by their families or there'd been family issues or had somehow lost their way and needed to be put into a boy's home or whatever, whatever reasons they were going into these boys' homes. They were actually using these young guys, programming them, turning them into their little killers or serial killers or exactly. whatever they did. This, I'm now convinced. There's not even a doubt in my mind anymore. 100%. Programming right. them to be what mm. they want them to be. And um, I'll go into this bit too with the MK Ultra. Horrendous. And I, spoke, so I spoke about this. Um, sorry, Chantel. I spoke about this to Gabby today. Now, there was, and I want to... Um, also point this out first too. I said to you about the houses, I called them houses, but the residents at Derek, and I said they were laboratories, okay? The reason, I know they were laboratories because what happened too was the officers or the pedophiles, whatever you want to call them, programmers and handlers, that's what I'll call them now because I know what was going on, okay? So these people were, were sitting in observation glass boxes watching us, at night time when we slept. That's what they were, glass observation boxes. Now, I worked out why they were in behind glass in these sealed rooms is because of, I, as I said to Gabby, my beliefs, how I ended up in that um, clinic was I believed that my bedding was material contaminated biological weapon, yeah, by, not weapons, by bi biological contamination with possibly the methyl bromide through, because methyl bromide, I want to explain to you too, they can use it in aerosol delivery, like through um, fire extinguishers. And they did use that historically back in those oh. days, but it's also odorless and it's also heavier than air. And mm -hmm. if it comes in contact with your skin or you breathe it in, that's when you have the complications, yeah, or all the complications with it. And that's how I believe they got me to the clinic was by contaminating my bed because I woke up sick that morning and nobody would have thought of anything, you know, a person just going to the clinic sick, like, on, you know what I mean, on his own accord, so to speak. That's how um, covert and sneaky they were. Eh? And yeah, CIA important. were known to do that too, material contamination. Yeah. It makes That's sense why, with glass too because it protects these observers from the chemical. Yeah, exactly, from the contamination, yeah. Yeah, mm. you're dead right. 100%. That's why they're in these observation boxes. They were protected. They knew what they were doing to us, so they couldn't be exposed to it because they knew, yeah, we were they, their lab rats, and they didn't want to be lab rats. So they, they sat behind protected glass and just monitored our behaviors. And right yeah. up to when you wanted to go to the toilet, gap, you know, you had to get out of your bed, stand at the end of your bed, stamp on the floor when they called you down. They'd even ask you when you go down to the observation box. What do you want to do, a stand up or a sit down? That's how much they'll document. Wow. Sure. Right up to how many times you use the toilet, you know, what you needed to do and so forth. Like, it's just ridiculous. Mm. You are monitored everything. Believe. And yeah, um, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna point this out about the programming in Derrick, okay? In the residence that I was at, I was in Wallara. Now I can name, Will, will include myself, luckily, that I wasn't fully programmed. You know, I'm, I was blessed with that, okay? But I've named three others in the same residence that I was in that became killers after Derek. Why? And I'll name the names because they've been, these were publicised before too. Les Murphy, done the Anita Cobby killer. He was one of the Anita Cobby killers. And that was he a was very, very style death as well. programmed in Derek. 
Mm -hmm. Then you had a guy called Philip Atkinson. He was wanted. I remember seeing him on, on the news. I might have been Australia's most wanted when it was on, something like that. He was wanted. He was known to frequent between Blacktown and Redfin. He was, and he was wanted for a double homicide. So there's another Derek one that came out to be a killer. And then there was Jeff Denman, who um, stole a car and ran over a security guard. You know, there's three people that come out of Derek that, that I know that ended up mm. killing people. You know what I mean? So how many others? The yeah, these are only the ones that have been caught as well, Stephen. So how yeah, exactly. many more? Yeah, exactly. This is yeah. shocking. Yep. It's absolutely right. and, and look, I, I just... Program. Yes, there was definitely, MK, and I'm going to, I need to emphasize this too. If anybody doubts that there was MK Ultra programming going on, Derek, all you have to do is go to 28, March 2018, I think it was, when it, um, I think it was 11th of March 2018. I know it was 2018. All you have to do is go onto YouTube, have a look at part one of Home Horrors, which was when they first aired Derek Boy's home, okay? And they had a lawyer on there by the name of Jason Parkinson. Now, his words is exactly what was going on at Derek, okay? He cut it short on saying MK, MK Ultra, but his words on national TV was that Derek was primary school for jail. In other words, we were being programmed to go to jail, like whatever way, whether we're killers or whatever, yeah? It's exactly... That, that was his words, you know? Creating, still for jail, so. Yeah. And just yeah, looking at the it. Derek setup too, we were talking about this um, earlier, Stephen, as well. Like, you know, Derek um, was originally built as a government vaccine research facility. So, you know, it's got this fairness to destroy biological warfare or biological samples, whatever oh, well, you want to call it. Yeah. But a military landing strip out the back, you know, it's... You know, this is an absolute epicenter of, you know, the CIA, ASIO, um, mind control programs in Australia. Yeah, 100%. Well, it was quite bizarre, as I said to you, Gabby, is that Derek was built well before 68 because the furnace is the big giveaway because that's how we used to get our hot water and stuff, like from the showers and stuff, you know what I mean? You know, for yourself around 68, you know, like things become modernised, like gas and, like, you know, and, and so forth, like other sources of energy. But this place was built long before 68. They just left the furnace there, and you're dead right. It was a government scientific research facility, and they mm -hmm. were producing vaccines and biological agents or whatever, whatever the materials and so forth, whatever. And, and everybody knows that biological waste has to be discarded in a furnace, yeah, but, and that's, mm. the, and, you know, I go back looking at Derek and I start to think, you know, I'd like to look at the statistics of state wards that didn't have no family whatsoever that would have went through Derek and have gone missing because, look, we all know what these Luciferians were doing and they're very devilish. I wouldn't be surprised at all if people went through that furnace as well, young kids. Mm. You know, I've, I've always sat and thought because the place was just boned at evil and they were, it was a Luciferian satanic pedophile operating in there. Yeah. All Luciferians. Yeah. And we know that, um, I know that we were talking about a particular murder or, um, you know, something went wrong in Derek and a, a boy passed away as you were coming in, Stephen, and how yes. that was how they um, manipulated that and told the boys and, um, yeah, basically just made it out that this person had committed suicide when it was completely... Yeah, what they, were good at, what they were good at is they, they manipulated 100% kids, okay? And th these are adults. We're talking about adults, yeah? Devilish adults. Uh, and the way they manipulated kids, they would tell... The, the, put their narrative out on how this, how this kid had died in Derek, okay? And once they put their narrative out, it became common knowledge, you know what I mean? And you know for yourself, mud sticks with common knowledge at times, but it doesn't gel with me. Like, I, yeah, I, I know exactly what they've done. But um, that's the way they're manipulating children, just tell them that, you know, and they know that children are going to talk and spread around, yeah? So that that was their, their saviour, was the children in there. 
what you know that they're manipulating and spreading the story around that he hung himself when the true narrative and the true fact of it was that he was murdered in there he was hung by these luciferians and i can mm. i can tell you something else too where th there is evidence of this too okay where they were hanging where they did probably hang this kid in there he didn't hang himself they murdered him don't forget gordon parsons is a survivor yeah and he, Barraclough, Mr. Barraclough, the youth worker, old welfare officer at Garrett, tried to hang Gordon Parsons, but the rope snapped. That's the only thing that saved Gordon. Mm. So there's two people, you know what I mean? Two, two, two hangings, when I say one death from hanging and one lucky escape. Absolutely. So, it's, it's just so sad to think, you know, we've got such little... Um, research or statistics from records from those boys like who knows what happened and what boys were being taken off the street etc especially with all this horrific experimentation going on as well you know i believe as i said to you the you know what was getting around Derek when i arrived there in in the june i believe that this must have happened early 77 start of 77 and um I believe when I've had my stroke, Gabby, there was a lot of people that were noticing my face. My left side of my face was dropping, yeah? And I wasn't responding to my name. A kid was laughing at my face and got in trouble for it, yeah? So I believe what's happened is that death's happened and they could see that I wasn't right, okay? As well as probably used it, you know, for two things. As I said, I believe I was sex trafficked out to Gunderman, yeah? But I believe, too, another reason they took me out of Derrick is because they were worried that I was going to pass away in Derrick and it would have sparked an investigation, two deaths in the same year. You believe what I'm saying? Mm, liability, yeah. 100%. So that's why I believe there was one reason why they took me out of, out of Derrick at that time. I was um, not with it at all, like pretty gone, yeah, just, as I said, fragmented memory of it. Get being mm -hmm. taken out. I don't even know how I returned. That's how bad it was. Wow. How old were you when you had your stroke? 13 years old, Chantel. Have you any idea what would have brought that on? Because that, I mean, you know. I believe, I said, okay, I'm going to say this to you. I've had frag, frag, fragmented memories of what happened to me in, in the clinic. Yeah, I was in and out of consciousness because I was drugged. But I believe it was either the drugs or the east of the torture of the ECT. And I believe more the ECT, the torture of the ECT, while I had a stroke. Because I have read it where Dean, one of the patients at Dr. Bailey, Dr. Harry Bailey, was doing the MK Ultra 2 with the electricity. One of them had a cerebral hemorrhage as well. That's wow. And that, that's the stroke I had was a cerebral hemorrhage. Mm. And it's it's through you know I've read a lot about it, but it's just it's burst vessels through yeah the electricity you know what I mean like uh, from the torture that's that, that was my yeah, first exactly. I, asked I you believe that. that's what my stroke was due to. That's what my intuition tells me. Wow, 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 wow. wow. Well, I again I just I'm I marvel yeah. at you for being back here and being able to tell a story. And, you know, honestly, like so many of the other survivors and overcomers on this planet, not one of these boys, the day will come when not one of these boys' names won't be known. And, yeah, you know, exactly. people like you are bringing that up so that we may honor their memory and this horrendous suppression and, and of, of torture and rape and abuse that has been going on for so, so, so long on this planet mm -hmm. um we need to definitely i mean yeah just thank you for coming yes. for step and saying yes, what you're saying to be done can't go on this way but um as i said Chantel, i've connected with a lot of direct victims and there was another one that i'll just tell you about with with the clinic and because gabby asked me about vaccines and that do you think they'll test them of course they were doing all sorts of stuff to us in there when we were drugged we were sedated yeah that's when they would have been using vaccines. And as I said, I remember the, the apparatus was put in my face there, yeah? like chemical exposure, yeah, and, and the spraying of, of the um, methyl bromide in kids' faces and stuff like that. Well, I connected with another Derek victim after he'd seen my first interview. That was 
on Out of the Gates in America. That was back in 2018, I think it was. And he told me, I won't mention names because I'm, you know, it's for his own privacy, but he said that he he contacted me because when he seen that I mentioned about the drugging when I was in there, got drugged in the clinic, he contacted me and he told me he was drugged three times in that clinic. He has no recollection of what they done to him in there, but he remembers when he come out of that clinic, it was at night time, and he said he was legless. He had to hang on to, to poles to walk or he'd sit down. He had to sit down and he couldn't walk. So whatever they done to him in there, like there. Uh, and that was three times they done it to him. Yeah. I've had I've spoken to a number of um Derek survivors um as well. And I think something a point that I wanted to make clear just for the people that aren't um aware and the people that aren't speaking out just yet is, you know, we're thinking, you know, these boys are taken to the clinic and, you know, they're under this horrific experimentation and that's enough of a horror in itself. But a number of the survivors I've spoken to as well were also being like sexually abused. They were being raped at the same time yeah. as these medical experiments were going on. Like it's, it's just absolutely heartbreaking to hear like what was going on in these so-called clinics. And, you know, since when does a state care have its own hospital you know it's um... yeah, exactly I was, you know, I was going to say something to you about that Gabby I've been to um as I said you've been to a couple of institutions yeah and not one of them has had I remember when I was nine years old Gabby my first institution I was in yeah and it was down south down near down past the Blangelad Forest actually like it was in a place called um Bundanoon, which is down just past Barrel okay when I was nine down there at, I, they didn't, this was a massive place too, this institution, like on, I think it was on five hectares or something and three residents and a school and gymnasium all on the one, in the one complex, you know. But I remember um, I went, had to go into hospital when I was in, in that place and have a hernia operation and they didn't even have their own um, hospital. They all had to go to a public hospital. As I said, Derek's the only one that I, I know of that had, a reformatory there, yeah? Right. Mm. And other things that I've never seen. As I said, you know, the furnace and the, you know, just this place was set up, honestly, as I said, this place was their testing grounds for, for MK Ultra and yeah, human case studies. And mm. It's definitely well, all there. Why do you so, think, yeah. I just want to clarify this and just put it straight <laughs> out there. What was the furnace for? In your opinion, uh, okay. With my knowledge, with biolo biological waste, okay, they get burning furnaces at high degree to make sure there's no contaminants left yet, yeah, high degrees, yeah. And this furnace would have been for their contaminated waste to start with. But I believe, as I said, Chantel, that was when it was a, a government scientific research facility. Then it changed over into Derrick in 1968. They opened the doors. I believe what they done, they got their stockpile of vaccines and biological chemicals and so forth, and then they used us as the lab rats. They stocked, stocked us up to do all these tests on us with the, as I said, MK Ultra sub-projects, their vaccinations and everything like that. We were, we were their, definitely their lab rats. Absolutely. And um, just to add to what Stephen says, because I completely agree with all of my research, um, you know, during the 50s and 60s, like Australia was really central to the CIA's um, biowarfare programs under MK Ultra, And that was um, when we talk, talked to Rachel Vaughan before. It's about the prion disease, so Kuru, um, they were attempting to weaponise that um, so they could make a biowarfare weapon, which could be put in this um, and it really is to disable the mental function of the masses and obviously they needed to test that a lot develop it etc so that was that was literally happening in universities hospitals institutions in the 50s and 60s and then because of some um, investigations going on overseas I feel it had to go a little bit un underboard um, and be delabeled somewhat and then just so conveniently we've moved a boy's a boys, a state boys' home, into a medical research facility. Yeah, definitely, Derek was definitely Derek was. You know, it was set up and designed for MK Ultra sub projects, and as I said, 
There was a number of covert operations, not only MKUltra, I believe that Pi was involved, pedophile information exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe that was going on there as well. Um, well, Frank Houston was involved with that as well. And exactly. he was um, he, he was exactly. in and around Derek as much as he was in and around Hillsong trafficking children. So, look, as I said, you had the, I believe, I'll say it with conviction, the CIA were involved in Derek. There was operatives there in that office that I told you about. I've seen the files always going across and coming back. Yeah. And I believe the ones, the ones that were looking after us, the program and handlers, these pedophiles, they were documenting everything in diaries. So I believe they were the ones doing the pie information exchange and stuff, why the CIA there were doing all the MK Ultra. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That office was handling all the MK Ultra, like, yeah. Yeah. All so the these files poor and so boys, the pedophiles. Poor boys being, yeah, poor boys being exploited for experimentation, for rape. It's just horrific. Child sex traffic and the lot. Everything's there. They would definitely, that's undeniable. You know, it's the, the, the amount of evidence there is just undeniable that, that this place was a human research facility. And as I said, they, they were practicing a number of covert operations in Derrick, and one of them was MK Ultra for sure. Yeah. It, it, it just that's can't true. be disputed. That, you know, if you go to all the MK Ultra sub projects and just break a few down and have a look at what I said went on in Derrick, they're all there. They're all in those sub projects. Mm. How old was Ivan Milat? I mean, uh, uh, like, is he quite a bit older than you? Do we know his yeah, background? He was, one of these boys' homes at some point. He was care. actually. I know what age he was when he was in um, Boys in Boys Town. He was the same age as I was when I went to Derek, thirteen years old. But Ivan Milat is older than me. I think he was seventy something when he died. I've only mm. just turned fifty eight. Um. Yeah, so I and, and you asked me before, Chantel, in the first interview that we've done, was he ever accountable for his crimes? Yes, he was. He spent a long time in jail. I think he spent something like 27 years, I think. Well, work it out. He 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 went to jail in 2006, yeah? And he only just died last year. So really he did, you know, he was accountable for his crimes, like he spent the time in, but the bad thing about it is that there is others that were involved in it that are still out that haven't been held accountable for their crimes. So he's never really he's never really blown the whistle on who he was working for. Chantel, I believe he has, right? But you know how the media and so forth are, they're never gonna tell you. I believe Malap would have would have said a few, had a few things to say, believe me. Yeah. Mm. Well, he had a personal friend. And lawyer John Marsden, they were friends for life. He was a Marsden was a very good family friend, like friend of the Malat family. Don't forget when this all started, um, Malat's trial, um, before his trial, sorry, his um, lawyer was John Marsden, and John Marsden dumped him like a sack of potatoes, and that was because John Marsden knew that something was going to come and his name was going to come into this. So he just had to disconnect for Ahmad Malat, you know what I mean? Yeah. Make out that Ivan, yeah, you know. And they said that Ivan sacked him. I couldn't see someone that was in dire straits sacking a lawyer that you trusted all your life, you know what I mean? Mm. I don't think that was the case. I think, as I said, trying under the bus, well, they've said to him, mate, you've just compromised everything. People are going to come undone through this and we've got to disconnect. From you and see you later, you're going to jail, you know what I mean? But I believe, yes, Malat would have said a lot of things, yeah? Mm. But the media ain't going to tell you. As you said, he was calling it out, you know? He was, he was, um, yeah, I remember him he professing his, yeah, well, he's not yeah, an Malak innocent man, <laughs> but he, he was always saying that he, he didn't do it alone, it wasn't just him right up until he passed. Um so I'm sure, like you said, Stephen, he would have been trying to get some other names in there, but they just silenced it. And on his on his official um, statement, he said that there were, um, yeah, a lot more people involved. Gabby, in there's something, something stood out to me about the Belangola Forest one time, and I said, bang, there is another culprit right there. Why is this person not locked up? I'll tell you what it was that I noticed. It was a photo taken of Ivan Malak exiting the bush the forest, yeah, because I know it was a forest. And the reason I can tell you why it was a forest was because of the belongings that he had in his possession when the photo was taken, right? 
So he's actually in the Belangalow Forest at night time with, um, what's her name, Deborah Everest dress he had in a hand and he had his sleeping bag in the other hand and it was at night time and someone took that photo of Ivan. He's a accomplice. Why, you know what I mean? Like things like that, there's the evidence there that there was more involved. You know what I mean? Just that photo alone says, yes, there's another person at that scene. You know what I mean? They, they took the photo of him. And what about the photos that that girl talked about, about the girls being on, on the camera, yeah? Their bodies, mm -hmm. yeah? When he lent the camera. Why wasn't that question? And there you go. There's another crime that was concealed by a family member. Serious crime. He concealed you know, murders. Why wasn't he charged and locked up in jail? Or at mm -hmm. least charged with, you know, concealing serious crimes. All the evidence was there and only one person got charged out of it all. Mm. They protect their own, that's for sure. Well, I've, no, no, I've no doubt yeah. that he was definitely mind controlled when he was young to do this and to be the fall guy and to take yeah, the well, he was definitely a patsy. He was definitely a patsy, just like Martin Brian Avery. That, that's how they disarmed us with our guns. They used the false, false, um, how can I say it? Like a false event. When I say mm -hmm. a false event, blamed a person for it that wasn't even there, but used their own, used Australian military men to do the job. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, used another guy's Patsy the Fall guy, and he's been sitting in jail for a long time, Martin Bryant now. And they do do it. There, there is, they use four guys, Patsy's, you know, that they sat up. So true. It's, a, it's such a limited um, narrative that we're actually told of the story at any given time, isn't it? And just as you were saying that, Stephen, it was reminding me of um, remembering um, Anthony Kidman. You know, he obviously ran the show here um, with MK Experimentation. Um, that Nicole's dad. Like, Nicole, good old Nicole's daddy, yes. Um, yeah. And yeah. Sil silencing a lot of victims um, through his you know, um, research, you know, he, he did a lot of um, published papers on learned helplessness, which is pretty much just breaking people down to the point where they just can't go on. Um, and yeah, it, it was only when Fiona, um, you know, took those allegations forward and they started being taken seriously. It's like the same thing happened to him. He got thrown under the bus by the, the cult um, and apparently suicided, etc. So that's, it's interesting how it's such a massive network. There's so many involved. And then when something comes undone and a little bit of truth comes out, a survivor gets their voice in there. It's just one person that's given up. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't know whether too many people know about um, Anthony Kidman, a bit of his background. You know, he was a biochemist, right? I believe mm -hmm. he was connected with the CIA. There's no, two, you know, like I was just saying, you know, the reason I say that because the CIA, during all their MK Ultra sub projects, LSD was one of them that they sourced. Yeah. Well, Anthony Kim was a biochemist and he was making LSD at Sydney University. And I believe that across at the time, if we look at these timelines, Gabby, mm -hmm. with, with um, the Nugent Hand Bank, okay, as I said, it went down, I think, in 1995, it ended up a subject of the Royal Commission in 19, 1988, mm. yeah, where they were washing all the dirty drug money through that bank used as a front and all the illegal arms running and, and funds off the egg, uh, illegal arms sales. And, and it's been documented that the CIA were using that money to fund institutions for MK Ultra sub projects. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Anthony Kidman would have been funded and they would have used, you know what, I believe that King's Cross was a hub of MK Ultra back in those days, because think of the prostitution, all the honey traps, and what is it, mm -hmm. Operation Climax, where they they were studying CDM. Uh, sorry, the CIA used to set up these, like what they call safe houses, okay, and they had one way vision, one way vision wow. sort of mirrored where they could look from another room and do all that document the case studies on human behaviour with prostitutes and so forth, yeah. And I think that's what was going on down. The, like that would have been a big MK Ultra hub down King's Cross back in the days. There was a lot of it, you know, LSD and that getting around that place there. Yeah? And you think about it, you know, as, as I said, there was child rape, sacrifices, all that went on down there. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And uh, Anthony yeah. Kidman, and Anthony Kidman's research is all about LSD and um, you know, That's what training I said. Money, uh, et cetera. So it's it, it's a CIA, it's CIA operation all the way. I mean, because um, CIA were known to buy all the LSD, you know what I mean, and distribute it, yeah. Yeah. Before and it was all for human for MK Ultra sub projects for their case studies. That's what it was for. Hmm. Yeah, as I said, yeah. And that's what stands out to me too, Gabby. And I keep saying this. It's not being disrespected, it's just that I know what these bastards get up to. They got the money. It's funny how Anthony Kidman come under the microscope of pedophilia and so forth, yeah? Takes off over to Malaysia, I think it was, and then dies, yeah. Then you got John Marsden was exposed as being a pedophile. And he get, he he had cancer, okay, allegedly had cancer. Goes over to Turkey and he, he died in Turkey. Like, I just find that bizarre. You with me? Yeah. I know that some That's of these great. people leave our soils and go under false identities and live another life, yeah? It happens. Yeah. Would not surprise us. I mean, yeah, and think how much. Yeah, and the money. And I'm just thinking, think how much Anthony Kidman's knowledge of MK Ultra and programming these you know, we consider the million multi-million dollar assets for them. Do you think they're gonna just get rid of him? He quite probably could have went underground, etc. So back into the military base. He was experimenting in military bases in Australia. So please to say go back to by the highest benefactors. So I don't believe they're dead. They have crisis actors and all of these funerals, you know what I mean? Seeing that a lot, aren't we? All these Mm. Wow. Dirty little wow. Australia, isn't it? <laughs> it's a dirty world we live in. Yeah. And I think we've all been living on a stage there, yeah? and that's it. And this is a great awakening. Mm-hmm. Sure is. And it ain't pretty what's been happening <laughs> right under our schnozzles while we've been sleeping and we wake up and it don't smell that good, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of yeah, shite and a lot of... Um, uh decaying humans put it that way mm-hmm. subhuman wow. yeah. they are they're subhuman they're not even human i agree yeah. i mean it's just wow the depravity of what what we're hearing to me that's i mean i'm not even shocked by things anymore really <laughs> No, I'm not even surprised by what goes on, but the depravity of what ha- what happens will never stop shocking me, honestly. Mm. And the lengths to which people have gone to hurt and destroy and maim, it makes me wonder, you know, there has to be something that started that to begin with, you know, because I don't really believe many humans are born evil or that evil, you know. But um, mm. wow, to just carry on the way no, that that's they've where been. it hands goes back to thinking, you know, you'd have to look at, as you said, I don't believe that there's natural born killers and so forth. And as you just said then, you know, I believe that these people are just programmed from, me, from, from the word go, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And we've got multi generational abuse. Um, so just this, these horrific yeah, things passed, passed down the line. Yeah, and you know we see that with so many, so much intergenerational state care, as well as the families, um, the cult families passing this down too. So, just all needs to come to an end. Sure, and how? Yeah, we go. Well, let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope we're there, nearly there. Gosh, it can't. I mean, it can't go on for much longer because wow. Although yeah, it's been Gabby, going on for too long. Yeah, it has been going on too long. And as I said to you, Gabby, the main object- objective here is, and we all know it, is save the children, okay? That's that's what we, we were on these platforms for, speaking out and all the rest of it, yeah? And um, I was just about to... So I just lost my train of thought about save the children, yeah. Okay, we've got to get these um, suppression orders, okay, there has to be mm-hmm. something done about these suppression orders, 90-year suppression orders that they put on these VIP pedophiles because if they ain't made transparent to the public, okay, which they should be, 
these pedophiles that are on that list and the people that are protecting them, uh, enabling them to go on further harming children, yeah, because they're still roaming around in society. So we really need to press having these suppression orders lifted and made transparent so we can have these perpetrators that are on it dealt with accordingly. Mm -hmm. because, so true, Stephen. You know, why, why they're still protected, you know, it's got, they're going to be damaging the now children and future generations of children, so it needs to stop. We need to have, need to really push on this to have them lifted hmm. because there's 28 on that list, whether they're still surviving or not, there would be, and there's some of them are still practising. Hmm. And there's eight, so from that Woods Royal Commission, as well as the list of 28, there's 8,000 private testimonies that have been um, put under a Privacy Act, and there's literally hundreds of, you know, very powerful pedophiles, um, you know, all across our society, and they deserve to be investigated. You know, those survivors yeah, deserve exposed. to be exposed. exposed because that's concealing what the government are actually doing by, by suppressing them is they're concealing serious crimes, just like what, what mm. um, Brian, uh, not Brian, yeah, Brian Houston's doing in court now. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. Concealing a ser serious crimes, yeah? And it's virtually, the, you know, it's perverting the course of justice too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, like, oh, no, what yeah. were you going to say? No, I just said unbelievable how it is a protection racket, pedophile, mm -hmm. Lucifer prote pedophile protection racket. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, and it, you can see how much they try and suppress this from the public, but like not have it out in the media because it is their weak link. Like once the public actually understands the amount of ritual abusers and pedophiles in power, raping children, allowing this experimentation on children to continue. You know, people aren't going to want to take orders and listen and pay taxes to these monsters. You know, it just, wow. it's just getting it out. It's enough. It's <laughs> absolutely enough. Honestly, it's enough. And people, seriously, we need to wake up. You know, we need to, we can't be turning blind eyes to this stuff anymore um, and calling us conspiracy theorists spreading misinformation. There is just so much evidence of this stuff going on. You know, we really just need to look at this and everyone, everyone needs to take responsibility for their role that they've played in turning a blind eye. And it's not to say it's your fault or whatever, but we are all responsible when we turn a blind eye and we choose to pretend it's not going on and say, well, I only want to see the beautiful things in the world. We, we don't have that liberty anymore. There's much beauty in the world, yes. And we have to balance our lives that, uh, that we still see the beauty because if we don't see the beauty, we're going to get sucked into this black hole as well. So life is all about balance. It's all about understanding there's, there's polarization. There's good and there's bad. And we have to polarize the bad with the good. But that doesn't mean that we don't see and allow the suffering of others to continue. Because every child that suffers is your child. Every, yeah, well, every I mean, as, a parent, as a parent, everybody has a duty of care to make sure that their, their child is protected and not harmed. You know? So the, the ones that turn a blind eye to it, very, you know, as I said, you, it's very negligent when you look at it. You know, they should um, exactly. be listening to what's going on. Exactly. And until it's your child, you know, the bottom line is people think this doesn't happen to them. You know, and, and what is really sad and the, the way that this works is that those who really believe that they are not... Um, accountable or it's got nothing to do with them or whatever the universe will give them a wake-up call and something will happen that it's your child or someone close to you and if that's the way that it's going to happen that we have to wake up or if that's going to be the thing that wakes us up I hope not I hope yeah, that no, just someone else's mm -hmm. horror story is enough to wake everyone up because it's just too much now you know it's too much we're hearing this more and more and more and i you know in the circles that i move in the majority of people won't see this 
they won't even accept it as reality. So until we all wake up and just say enough, mm-hmm. it'll continue to happen. And I hope to God it's not your child. That's all you I'm know, saying. Sean, I'm going to say something to you, what you're saying about the ignorance in society about this, okay? I even seen something the other day and it was quite disturbing. I nearly commented on it and I thought, no, I'll just let it go. And I meant to say something to Gabby. Gabby, I'm on a site, right? It's a humor site and it's called shit that cracks me up, okay? And you know, you know how far and things that you, sh- you can put on there and things you, you, you just wouldn't put on there, right? Some moron put Adrian Wells's video on there and said shit that cracks me up. Like, as I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I was quite, you know, quite pissed off about it, actually, yeah. I just thought he's a victim, yeah, when I say a surviving victim, telling his story, and you think it's shit that cracks you up. you got to pull your head in, you know, yeah, you moron whoever put that on, shit that cracked me up. Yeah. So people like that, ignorance, and, and, and this dude here will only take notice if it ever happens to one of his children or, or, or loved ones, yeah? That's, that's the point. Ignorance. That's the type of ignorance that's out there, you know? Mm-hmm. That's the point. You know, when people, when people uh, like that put stuff like that out there and are that ignorant, sadly, they're the ones that are going to get the biggest wake-up calls because there's no more time anymore for this to continue, honestly. Yeah. No. So I really no. hope that everyone who is watching these stories And there's more and more and more of them coming out, you know, and not just in Australia. South Africans are starting to speak up now as well. Americans have been speaking up for a long time. Europeans, you know, people from the Netherlands, especially um, the UK uh, with these horrendous royal families that have been, you know, with these elite bloodlines and stuff that have been doing horrific things to children for the longest time. You know, people are speaking up more and more. And if that's the shit that cracks you up, I'm really just so sad for you. And I'm so sorry that that is where your mind is still at because it cracks me up, but in a horrible way. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to say that they're on the other side of the fence to even do so or say something like that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. 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 I, I hope, you know, I hope that that's a paid troll that does that because only in my mind, ignorance and, and trolls, we know there's paid trolls out there to harass people like Adrian and you guys, no doubt, um, us as well. <laughs> but um, let's, let's hope that it's that and not someone who is that fast asleep, honestly. You know, anyway, guys. No, sorry. Carry on. No, no, no carry I was on. Just say, if that was something, a video of mine or something put on shit, someone put on shit that cracks me up, that would trigger me badly, you know. That'd send me into a, a bit of a rage, you know what I mean? I'd want to know where the person lives. So yeah, you just got to be careful and be sensitive with survivors, yeah. Very you be, you know, you gotta be sensitive to you can't go putting things like that because you yeah, you're gonna trigger survivors by doing that. Absolutely. Not, not, Absolutely. Yeah, like I even got angry seeing it on there and it wasn't mine. I just thought it, you know what I mean? Like of course. Mm-hmm. It's just disgraceful. Wake up. Anyway, like said, yeah. That's it. The ignorance let's... needs to stop and people need to pay attention. That's it. Hmm. Let's hope that time is sooner rather than later that um, we start awakening to the truth. So I say thank you so much. Sorry. Do you want to say something else, Stephen? Sorry, we've got a bit of a lag, yeah? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I meant to say, because I spoke to Gabby about this too. Another reason I keep touching on Ivan Malat, people are going to think, you know, give up because Ivan Malat's gone. No, because there's many victims still out there of Ivan Malat, yeah? So this is important to continue this to make people aware of what's going on. But also... um, Oh, I've lost my train of thought again. I get get lost here. Oh, why I keep yeah. mentioning Ivan Malat too. The main objective that I want to punch home to people too is that, yes, he nominated not just 
murdering and abducting women, men and women. It was men, women and children. And I keep emphasising that he was trafficking these children through Costello's for the, for the elites, okay? So we need to know what Ibn Alat's activities really were. He wasn't just the backpacker murderer, as they, they dubbed him as. I need to get that out. It was men, women and children. And we all know that, and, and um, what's his name? The lawyer, Leon Sokolsky, did say that Ivan Malat was mysteriously rich when he met him. And we all know that Ivan Malat wasn't mysteriously rich. We know that sex trafficking of children or humans is big money. It's big, yeah. There's more money in it than the drug industry. So that's, exactly. yeah, not so mysteriously rich. But I need to point that out, that Malat was not just abducting men and women it was children as well so mm -hmm. absolutely and he was programmed to do so yeah 100 percent, he was he was MK who, programmed, program. who programmed him would be the next question people should ask and why well i guess the luciferians that were running operating that institution that he was in mm -hmm. they would have been cia funded just like Derek as well Okay, so then we've got a question, and that's why I say, you know, that, that that would be something I'd put out to the general public. Ask yourselves why, and then go and do that research. You see, it doesn't just stop here. It's no, this no, rabbit hole no. gets deeper and deeper. And um, why would the why would the three letter agencies, or as Tom Altas calls them, the Alphabet Boys, why would they be doing that, um, and for who? And then yeah, we would have a good time, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, Stephen, thank you so much for your time again today. Really, really, really appreciate you being here. And as always, invaluable information and would look definitely look forward to having you back again. And uh, Gabs, thank you so much for organizing Stephen to be here and for, again, everything that you do. And um, Look forward to having you back next week again. Mm -hmm. I look forward to coming back and I really appreciate you inviting me on the program. Much appreciated. <laughs> I um okay. I quite Thanks. enjoy some of our topics actually. So yeah. And it's aware and making, you know, it's making people aware of what's going on out there, what really is going on to the narratives that you're being told by the mainstream media. Yeah, absolutely. This is the real news. This is where the real news sits is on these platforms now. Isn't it? Exactly. It certainly is. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you for being so brave and um, speaking out for all of the children and all of the people that can't as well, Stephen. Um, you know, your story from Jarek is so powerful because there's many that can't speak and there's also many that are no longer with us. So... You know, we are so blessed to have you being a voice for all of those boys at this time. Absolutely. Yeah, no, as I said to you, I'm here. Um, my, my objectives and the reason I do this is for the now children and future generations of children, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. And I understand your platforms, yeah, have the same object, objectives and so forth, yeah. Thank you again. Okay, guys and girls, Thanks. thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, and I'll talk to you shortly, Gabby and Morn and Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't already, please give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. Find us on Facebook, BitChute, Twitter, Telegram, and Odyssey. As we said in the beginning, we've been struck from ARA, Aquarius Rising Africa, for a week or so, another week or 10 days. So we'll be putting this on our back channels. Um, find us and I think we might just put it on solutions as well uh, for the moment anyway so wonderful take care guys and girls god bless you do your research and stay very very suspicious of what you just see on the surface <laughs> always look deeper there's always more and more going down that rabbit hole <laughs> there's always a call and when you find the call you'll know <laughs> Thank you. Mwah. God bless you all. Thank Take you. care of Thank yourself. You, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, my God. Thank you.